Now, obviously, as an anarchist, I oppose affirmative action, welfare, public education, and the like because their status programs and of such are inherently unavoidably grounded in violence and the perpetuation of power structures. As status programs, they ultimately do more bad than good, and of course, given freedom, we could accomplish their stated ends far more efficiently without oppressing anyone. But there's nary an anarchist in the world that would go out of their way to abolish such projects first. And the reason for this is strategy. The first task of a prisoner is to escape. And with that goal in mind, we're not going to stop eating the meals they give us. Surely those meals are poisoning us. Surely those meals are sapping our strength and conditioning us to salivate on command by the prison guards. But, you know, at the end of the day, we must stay alive. In examining socialist programs, it's critical that we not sully our analysis with instinctive allegiances, but instead look only upon how effective those programs are at sustaining us. If the warden takes away our mules, many of us will die in our cells. This makes the prison's food program a momentary necessity. If people are locked out of jobs by corporate monopolies that our government sets up and their homes are bulldozed by investment firms with politicians in their pockets, those people are not going to find new lives as roving vigilantes taking out bureaucrats and burning down office blocks. No, they're going to end up in even greater poverty, abject misery, and alienation, spreading the burden throughout their social nets. Socialist programs, we all know, tow a balance between crippling the working class enough to keep them unable to revolt and satiating them enough with illusions of security to make them unwilling. The trick, as any half-cock fool with a big beard could tell you, lies in exploiting the inherent friction between these two status tactics and generating the sort of dynamic social instabilities that can make their analysis subject to calculation limits, where they can't accurately judge which to give us where, when the carrot and the stick are frantically applied in such a way as to inflame dissent, and then supply us sufficient resources to rebel. This is the core of our strategy with regards to their quote-unquote public services. We embrace that which will keep us in the fight and reject everything else. At the same time, we struggled to continue leading insurrection, building garden boxes in the windows of our cells, and preparing to retake that which they have not allowed us to organize for ourselves. So, when I look upon social programs like affirmative actions, mandatory quotas, or biases, my first step is to recognize that, since ends and means are interconnected, such a status program will never solve racism, or even really make inroads, the application of status depression will only further inflame and ingrain the social psychoses at hand, although they may make strides towards some superficial semblance of material equality. The status and hierarchical character of affirmative action is undeniable. But that said, the second step is to investigate whether, despite those long-term ill effects, such a program is strategically necessary to our current survival. And while getting into fancy colleges and jobs at a higher rate is clearly not a matter of material survival entirely, one can argue that in some ways it provides exit opportunities from inner city schools and other forms of public education, and will allow in some measure an underclass to retain access to intellectual weaponry, which does directly pertain to the survival of resistance. Similarly, although hate crimes laws are a ridiculous step towards the outright criminalization of thought itself, it's worth remembering that anything that stops lynchings should be tallied as keeping us alive. The strategic and tactical distinctions we're forced to make on such issues are necessarily going to be complex and nuanced, but at the same time as anarchists, we can never lose sight of the fact that these programs are evil and that ultimately we oppose them. Classic welfare programs, of course, are the most clear-cut example. Since my family and I owe our lives many times over to food stamps and the housing authority, I'm not going to pretend I'm not biased. Obviously, any welfare program is deeply predicated upon state violence in the form of taxation and puts a superficial band-aid upon the immediacy of capitalism's crimes. But if you think welfare leaves a, the poor a bunch of lazy queens dependent upon the system and defensive of it, well, you've never been forced to sit and wait while your life hung on the whims of a government bureaucracy. Socialist programs that keep the poor alive are always a good thing, strategically. They sustain the class most likely to lead any insurrection, and at the same time inspire that class a uh, fierce uh, hatred of the government, as well as a lasting critique of its inefficiency compared to self-organization. All are reasons to momentarily avoid directly attacking such programs, but in no means are they reasons to avoid conflict with them altogether. As with any status means, socialist programs will ultimately only further statist ends. And if by accident they give us breathing room, we as prisoners are obliged to seize it, to fight tooth and nail to build our own capacity for charity, mutual aid, and self-sufficiency when they're not looking. The only solution, ultimately, to socialist programs is to make them irrelevant.